that our bodies are so resilient. And as long as we're providing them with good nutrients and herbs and rest, and we're really giving it kind of what it needs, that it has such a capacity to rebuild and restore. Hello, friends, and welcome back to Medicine Stories, episode 34. This is the second part of my interview with Anya Robinson. If you haven't listened to the first part yet, it's the most recent episode. I've gotten a huge response from listeners, um, some really helpful information about women's health. And we continue that conversation today, and we also get into more of Anya's personal medicine stories. I want to let you know that This intro is going to be, I think, slightly longer than usual. Not much. It's probably going to be about 20, 30 minutes long. If you really don't want to hear the intro, you can skip ahead. Um, Every podcast player has buttons where you can skip ahead by a certain number of seconds, or you can also just put your finger on the little bar and, you know, drag the ball forward. Um, and just, you can tell when the interview starts by listening. So, uh, I also want to say that Anya and I give so many resources, especially books in this interview. And I have made sure to put every single book in the show notes in the links section. And, um, I always try to do that, but from now on, I'm going to be super, super fastidious about doing it. Because I always hear from people who are like, what was that thing you mentioned? And what was that book? What was that film, that podcast? And um, I mean, I, I get it. I do that all the time when I'm listening to stuff and, you know, want to go back and make sure that I got the name right or whatever, you know. But what I would like to suggest, because this is what I finally learned to do rather than going back to the podcast and trying to skip forward and backward and where was it where they talked about that um, is if I don't have time right then to stop and write down the resource I'm interested in, I take a screenshot on my phone or on my computer of where I'm at in the podcast. And then I can go back later and say, oh, at one hour and six seconds, six minutes and 32 seconds is where they talked about that book. And then I can hear it again and I can write it down. I do always try to respond to people when they ask me that, but I just thought I'd give that little tip And always, of course, check the show notes, too, because the info is going to be there. Um, So I've had a number of people write and ask me how keto is going for me. I talked about doing the ketogenic diet and why it makes sense to me as someone with a longstanding fascination with uh, human evolution and diet. And... So I talked about that in the intro to episode 28. Um, So I have been like cycling in and out of ketosis because what has come to me since recording that intro is that that's really the best way to do it. It comes from a few different sources, um, Dave Asprey, Dr. Mercola, and John Dillard, who is an Ayurvedic practitioner and the host of the Life Spa podcast. I found that podcast when I was um, searching in the podcast app for interviews with Dr. Zach Bush, who I've talked about many times on this show. It's Z-A-C-H. I have just made it my goal to listen to every single podcast he's ever been interviewed on because I think his work and his message and his ideas and innovations regarding human health and the microbiome and the soil and so much more um, is vitally, vitally important. So he had an interview on that podcast that I listened to, and I was super impressed with the host, this John guy. Um, The tagline of that podcast, which again is Life Spa, is like ancient wisdom and modern science, you know, the merging of the two through an Ayurvedic lens. And it's super great. And I was scrolling back through his podcast titles, and one was about ketosis and like the benefits and drawbacks of it. So I listened to that. And he really talks about this idea of cycling and how current research, which I think is on rats, if I remember correctly. So I'm not sure, you know, 
we're different animals than rats, but still the what's really emerging is that it's not something that we need to be in all the time. And of course, I acknowledge that there are people with certain um, illnesses and ailments who it really feels best to them to always be in ketosis and to have almost zero sugars or carbs ever enter their body. People with cancer and different autoimmune and inflammatory issues. But for someone without those issues, um, it just feels best to me to go in and out. And I don't really have that down to like a science, you know, I probably should. I'm sure other people are much more intentional with how they're doing it. Um, but one thing I noticed is that when I was in ketosis, my periods were really bad, really bad, uh, super emotional and super crampy. And we, we talk about those things in this interview with Anya. We talk about menstrual health for the first few minutes here, but so I'm in a Facebook group of women doing keto. And I went and I searched in that group for periods and every post was saying the same thing, much worse symptoms, um, or like bleeding twice a month or haven't gotten their periods in months since they started keto. And so I would like to know more about that. I mean, to me, that's, that's not a good, that's not an, that's an indicator that this is maybe not the best diet for people or that we need to figure out, these women need to figure out something. I don't know. But, you know, menstrual health is really a um, reflection of overall health. So seeing how much being in ketosis is messing with so many women's periods really made me curious and made me think this isn't something I want to do all the time. So I'm still working with it and just kind of trying to follow my body's signals and not get too caught up in any sort of dogma. Um, I'm still eating way less carbs than I used to and focusing more on high quality fats than I used to. And I feel good. And, um, just, you know, loosening, loosening my ideas of how things should be, especially when it comes to diet is, feels really important to me. Uh, we talked about food confusion a number of times on this show and, um, I wanted to read a passage from a book I'm reading regarding that. Uh, First, I'm going to tell you how I found this book, though, because it was in that podcast on LifeSpot about ketosis, and he gave this, he talked about how apparently the Inuits, who evolved pretty much eating a pure ketogenic diet, they're eating almost all animal fats and proteins with no carbohydrates living so far in the north, um, evolved a gene to keep them out of ketosis. And, you know, he talked about this as like a pretty, pretty solid indicator that it's not good for a human body to be in ketosis all the time. And he said he got that information from this book. And so I ordered this book and have been reading it. And first I have to say that that information is actually not in this book. So I ended up looking it up online and finding the study and I didn't really dive too deeply into it. Not enough to like make a call and say if it's you know, I don't know. There's just, I, I don't want to make any calls on anything. I'm not a dietitian. I'm not a nutrition expert in any way, but I think that's a really interesting piece of information and something that, um, convinces me at least that it's not something I need to be doing all the time. So this book is called the story of the human body evolution, health and disease by Daniel E. Lieberman. And again, you can find it in the show notes and, If you are someone like me who just loves learning about health and being a human from an evolutionary perspective, this is an amazing book. Uh, He's not trying to push any dietary agenda. You know, he's not like a paleo guy or anything like that, writing his his diet book based on his dogmatic beliefs. He's, um, you know, an evolutionary biologist, and it's really well written really applicable to daily life. Um, It doesn't just look at diet at all, but it definitely, definitely looks at diet. And I just love it. If you listened to episode 18 with Susie Hazen and were into the things we talked about, you would probably really like this book. So I just wanted to read this one paragraph from it because I think it echoes back to so much of what we've talked about on the show. And there were a lot of things that I just found helpful and interesting in this paragraph. So if you do get this book, it's on page 166. 
And it starts out, another application of evolutionary medicine is to recognize that many symptoms are actually adaptations, thus helping doctors and patients rethink the way we treat some illnesses and injuries. How often do you take an over-the-counter medication at the first sign of fever, nausea, diarrhea, or just aches and pains? These discomforts are widely regarded as symptoms to alleviate. But evolutionary perspectives indicate that they can be adaptations to heed and put into service. Fevers help your body fight infections. Joint and muscle pains can be signals to cause you to cease doing something harmful, like running incorrectly. And nausea and diarrhea assist you in purging harmful bugs and toxins. Moreover, as chapter 1 emphasized, adaption is a tricky concept. The human body's adaptations evolved long ago solely because they had increased how many surviving offspring our ancestors had. Consequently, we sometimes get sick because natural selection generally favors fertility over health, meaning we didn't necessarily evolve to be healthy. Isn't that interesting? We evolved to have as many kids as possible not to be in perfect health. For example, because Paleolithic hunter-gatherers faced periodic shortages of food and they had to be very physically active, they were selected to crave energy-rich foods and rest whenever possible, helping them to store fat and devote more energy to reproduction. An evolutionary perspective predicts that most diets and fitness programs will fail, as they do, because we still don't know how to counter once adaptive primal instincts to eat donuts and take the elevator. Further, because the body is a complex jumble of adaptations, all of which have costs and benefits, and some of which conflict with one another, there is no such thing as a perfect, optimal diet or fitness program. Our bodies are full of compromises. So, man, those last couple sentences, I really loved seeing that perspective um, because I have tended for years now to think that there is a perfect or optimal diet or fitness program for me, not for everyone, but for me. And it's just a matter of me figuring out what it is and which foods are totally super awesome and good for me and only do good things. And just this idea that the body is a complex jumble of adaptations, all of which have costs and benefits is so helpful. And I think that applies to food too, like almost maybe not almost any food. I don't know what percentage of foods, but many foods that we're going to eat are going to have costs and benefits. Um, And so we can just kind of do our best and not get too caught up obsessing over it. I also really loved that he talked about symptom suppression. This is something I've talked about before um, in episode 30 with Scylla Whatcott. And I have a video on my blog at mythicmedicine.love talking about an herbalist perspective on cold and flu and just how important it is to not suppress symptoms, especially um, symptoms that are helping the body to deal with an infection and to move it out and to move the energy, such as fever and diarrhea. And I just thought it was really neat to see that reflected in this book that has nothing to do with herbalism or homeopathy or natural health in any way. But of course, so much of natural health really is predicated on an understanding of evolutionary biology and who we are as humans and what we are adapted for and what is most likely to help us be in a state of health and wholeness and balance. And just another um, sentence from this book that I thought was relevant to what Anya and I talk about today, because we talk about the menstrual cycle and PMS symptoms. And one thing that he says in this book is when women cycle, they repeatedly experience high doses of estrogen. And we talked about estrogen dominance, of course, in the most recent episode with Anya, the one that already came out. And just, um, you know, reading this made me realize it kind of validated like yeah periods are hard the menstrual cycle is a difficult thing because we are dealing with these huge surges of hormones like it's not all in your head or it's not necessarily something that can be totally fixed with the perfect optimal diet or lifestyle you know we're really dealing with some very serious um very tangible surges of hormones. 
So again, you might like episode 18 with Susie Hazen. And also in that episode, Susie and I talk a lot about liver and like consuming liver and about iron and getting enough iron and what iron means for women. And Ani and I talk about those things in this episode too. Um, and another episode in which menstruation was a focus was episode 20 with Cammie McBride. Cami was my first ever and most important always herb teacher. And she's just um, an amazing powerhouse of herbal knowledge and knowledge about women's bodies. And so we talk about really different things related to menstruation than Anya and I talk about today. And if you like what you hear today, you'll really like that in episode 20. And hey, speaking of Cami, last night she emailed me to tell me that she is going to reopen her handcrafted herbal oils online course um, this week only because she's hearing from so many people who want to make their own Christmas gifts. Um, so if you're interested in doing that, Cami is the person who taught me how to make herb infused oils. She's amazing. This course is beautiful. It has so much good information, such a strong community around it. Um, generally, when she releases it in the summertime, it kind of, you know, drips out over a period of a few weeks. But for this special Christmas time launch, she's just releasing it all at one time. So you can get all the information right now this week and get going with your own herbal body oiling practice. Um, so the link to that will be in the show notes to this episode. I'll have it right at the very top so it's really easy for you to find if you're interested in that. Um, Anya and I have a giveaway going on to, to celebrate these two episodes coming out. They, it is on Patreon for supporters of this podcast at the $2 level. That is at patreon.com slash medicine stories. And the giveaway is that you'll win a hundred dollar gift certificate to my online shop, which is uh, mythic medicinals and also a hundred dollar gift certificate to Anya's online shop, which is mana medicinals. So $200 worth of herbal medicine and it's been really fun seeing the comments come in on that post. There's a lot of other really great things available there on Patreon for you. And just thank you so much to everyone who has supported the show. It's been a year. It was the year anniversary um, last week. And I'm feeling pretty good that I got 33 episodes out in a year. That's more than I would have thought if I didn't look at that number. It means I've done more than two a month <laughs> for 52 weeks. Um, and yeah, it's still really not easy to make this happen. Having a two-year-old, you know, it's, and it's going to be years until like the demands on my time as far as mothering is concerned, um, start to abate and lessen a little bit. And it's always, I feel like I'm like clawing my way to my own space so I can make this podcast happen, but really appreciate the support of the patrons and of my husband and of the two wonderful women who come and watch Nixie for some hours during the week so that I can do this. Um, it's been really amazing and I'm really grateful. And on a totally separate note, I love Christmas time. I'm so happy it's here. We're getting our tree tomorrow. I can't wait. Um, I just really feel what I'm really feeling this year about Christmas. I'm thinking about my grandma, Ainie. And how much she loved Christmas. I mean, it was like, not not only in December did this woman love Christmas, you know. I remember her singing um, Santa Claus is Coming to Town to me to get me to take a nap, like in the summertime. She sang that song year-round. And she had so many Christmas sweaters. They went all out decorating their house. All out she made it super magical for me and my sister and our cousins. And I just, this year for the first time, kind of feel like this sacred responsibility, um, this like sacred reciprocity toward her to, to carry the Christmas spirit forward for my children. And luckily that's easy for me to do because I really love Christmas too. And we love getting the tree and 
decorating as well. Um, and my husband Owen and I take Christmas music very seriously, very carefully curated um, vinyl collection of Christmas albums. And it's just really, it's just really fun. I'm just so grateful. You know, I remember reading this quote when I was like in middle school that <laughs> seems so cheesy, but it was Christmas is the day that holds time together. And I kind of always have thought that that's true. It's like this, especially in these really disconnected modern times where we don't have rituals, we don't have shared collective experiences anymore, especially right now when everything is so fragmented politically and there's just so much pain everywhere. Um, and I know that Christmas causes pain for a lot of people too, but it's just like this one, this one bright light that we carry forward from our ancestors. You know, the roots of Christmas go so deep. They go so, so deep. Um, and I just, I don't know. I'm really happy at this time of year. Um, so I hope you're happy too. I hope you can feel some warmth and some joy during this solstice Christmas season. It's really just like an excuse for magic, I think, the Christmas season. Um, and of course, I want to acknowledge that not everyone's ancestors um, came from the northern climates, really out of which Christmas and solstice celebrations um, evolved, but, you know, even people who don't have the deep ancestry of Christmas celebrators, I think most of us, most of us, especially in America, have at least the last few generations of, of people who celebrated Christmas. Um, and also real quick with the release of Cami's handcrafted herbal oils class, um, I didn't give the dates. And so people in the future might listen to this and be like, when is it? It's the first week of December here in 2018. So like the third through seventh, I believe, is when the cart is open to purchase that. So let me tell you very quickly what Ani and I talk about today. Um, why to start herbally and nutritionally preparing for your period at ovulation. So smart. I'm going to start doing that understanding nutritional needs throughout the menstrual cycle, tracking your period, coffee and chocolate for the cycling woman, good or bad, I say as I'm sitting here with some chocolate next to me, um, iron, blood, oxygen, and women, how Anya overcame six years of alcohol and drug abuse and built a healthy and healing life. We both share our stories of growing up with an alcoholic parent and of our mother's deaths and what it feels like when you get that phone call that we all dread. A super important but always overlooked perspective on nutrient deficiency in addicts and the role of nutrition in recovery. Uh, it's never too late to change your path. We talk about when Anya found out about her German great-grandmother being the town mystic and tarot reader, and how this ancestor's sensitivity has echoed down throughout the mother line. Uh, food, drink, and herbs for winter nourishment, and Carminatives, a simple, delicious, and healing class of herbal medicine that you already have in your kitchen. Um, I want to say, too, that if you are someone whose life has been touched by addiction, which I think might be all of us, I recently heard a really great podcast episode all about this. It's on Russell Brand's podcast, Under the Skin. And it's his interview with Gabor Mate. Um, you know, they've both written really incredible books on addiction, uh, Russell through the perspective of someone who's been there himself, and Gabor as a doctor who treated severe addicts for a very long time. Um, Gabor Mate is another person who, like, you can just search his name in whatever podcast player you use and listen to any episode any podcast he's ever been interviewed on, and it's going to be amazing. I saw him speak at the Psychedelic Science Conference in 2013, um, and I just, he's just one of my heroes, um, and Russell as well. You know, I just think they're both geniuses, and they're both saints, and they're lovely, lovely people. One final thing is that we just released our second batch of extra potent elderberry elixir of the season. 
can find that at mythicmedicine.love slash shop. And Friday, December 14th is the last day to place an order to guarantee Christmas delivery. Um, oh, and we have gift cards available this year for the first time ever, too, if you would like to give the gift of herbal medicine. Okay, thanks so much for listening, and let's dive into this interview with Anya Robinson. Okay, hey Anya, welcome back to Medicine Stories. Hi Amber. Um, we got such a good response from your <laughs> from your podcast, as you know. Yeah, I'm so excited that uh, so many women found the information really helpful and just excited that there was so much response to it. It feels really good. Yeah, I love doing giveaways on Patreon because in order to enter, I have people comment talking about what part of the episode spoke to them the most. And it's just so, I mean, I put out these podcasts and every now and then I hear something good or I'll hear a real general thing, you know, about the podcast being helpful for people, but to get a flood of these really specific comments about what exactly was said that changed someone's life is so heartening. And um, so, yeah, just women really need this information. And I'm so grateful to you for sharing what you know. And I thought that we would begin today by sort of continuing the really um, like sciencey, medical, clinical uh, talk about about women's health and getting a little more into periods and um, just straight up going to make this like really personal because I'm PMSing this week and I'm like, wow, I really go through some some shit when I'm PMSing and it's kind of easy to downplay it or ignore it, especially once it passes, you know, but since I'm like in it so deeply right now, I thought that um, I would just ask you about some of my symptoms and kind of see what your, because I know they're just universal, Um, you know, what your knowledge base is on them or if you have any recommendations. Does that sound okay? Yeah, definitely. All right. So I cramp for like seven to 10 days before I actually start bleeding. And it's not bad. It's not like the kind of cramps that you get when you actually do start bleeding, you know, for the first day or something maybe for me. But it's just like this feeling in my uterus that I feel really strongly and in my lower back too. And sometimes bad enough that I need a heating pad. And you said it's the seven to 10 days, seven to 10. I can always, something just shifts in my body and it's almost always exactly 10 days before I start bleeding that I just know, okay, I just moved into like my, you know, premenstrual time. Mm -hmm. Well, I think one thing um, that can be really helpful and that a lot of people kind of overlook is is starting menstrual support around the time of ovulation. So basically once you're ovulating, which you know generally, very generally speaking, is around midway through your cycle, um, and then we're moving into the luteal phase, which you know is typically somewhere around 10 to 14 days. And it can be really helpful um, starting at ovulation to really amp up some of your um, nutrition. And there's a few different supplements that can be really helpful specifically for cramping and PMS symptoms. So one of the big ones is magnesium. And there's been so many studies that have shown magnesium obviously is helpful for all sorts of menstrual cramping. And magnesium is one of those minerals that as we were talking about before it's just really not in our soils the way that it used to be and in order to get enough magnesium in some of our foods we would have to just eat outrageous amounts of them that's not really practical so magnesium is definitely something that i recommend supplementing and um it's super it's super important to really ramp that up around the time of ovulation. So I usually recommend women to do somewhere between 300 and 900 milligrams a day, um, starting, you know, midway through your cycle and then going all the way through or just all month if you really want. I think that, again, magnesium if we're stressed out at all, we blow through our magnesium reserves. It's so important for so many different facets of our health. Um, 
It's also really involved in the release and the binding of serotonin in the brain. So magnesium can be really mm-hmm. helpful for like any sort of depression or like broody symptoms that can come along with PMS as well. Um, and also magnesium is depleted during that luteal phase. So as our hormones are kind of shifting in that last phase of the cycle, we're going through even more magnesium. So that's why, um, that supplementation can be really helpful. As far as foods go, we find magnesium in our dark leafy greens, um, nuts and seeds are high in magnesium, millet, uh, let's see what else, kelp, um, molasses, bananas. But I think I read something in order to get our daily dose in leafy greens, we would need like 20 cups of leafy greens. So, I mean, if, if you can do that, then more power to you. And that's awesome. Um, but it is one of the things that I recommend supplementing. And I generally like, um, the form citrate is pretty easily absorbed. And there's also a form, um, called magnesium malate that is pretty, uh, easily absorbed and works well for those symptoms too. Are those both, um, like something that you take internally in through the mouth? Yeah. And there's, you know, there's, um, you can get kind of or pill form and also there's a product or similar products, kind of like the magnesium calm, that's Mm -hmm. magnesium citrate. And I really like that just because you can add it to your water. Um, it can really help in the evening for people to wind down. It's really calming and, um, it's, it tastes good. And it's just a nice way if you don't, if you're opposed to taking sort of pills at all, it's a nice way to be able to get the magnesium in there and get some good electrolytes. Um, and it can also really help, um, move your bowels too. So if constipation is something that you deal with during that time too, the magnesium is kind of a win-win there also. Mm, Yeah. I love taking calm when I was pregnant. It's funny that I kind of fell out of it. That's such a good idea. And I also have a, a transdermal oil that I use. Oh, yeah. And then, of course, Epsom salt baths are a great way to be able to get magnesium as well. So you don't have to just be um, taking it internally. So taking Epsom salt baths or, yeah, those transdermal oils can be really nice. You could mix that in with a herbal body oil and that would probably be lovely. Yeah. Um, I just want to put this out there, too, that if anyone's been thinking about doing a float tank, um, another, another great benefit of floating is that you are just floating in magnesium because there's, it's so super saturated with Epsom salts in there. Um, that it's like this huge dose of magnesium to the body through the skin when you do a float tank. And I've heard people, um, conjecture that that's like half the reason people feel so good when they step out of those tanks is because they've just been so infused with magnesium. That's cool. I actually didn't know that. That makes me really want to do it now. <laughs> oh, you should. Um, and I love learning that too about the effects of magnesium on mood because, you know, of course, that's another part of my PMS symptoms. Is I just get a lot more broody and moody and like, mm, everything sucks. <laughs> yeah, it can be really helpful also for bloating and breast swelling. And yeah, just those premenstrual mood fluctuations. Um, and then the other, um, supplement that I pretty highly recommend for, for menses is vitamin B6. And even if you're doing kind of a full spectrum B vitamin, you're probably not getting as much B6 as you would want for it to be therapeutic in this way. Um, and again, it works a lot with neurotransmitters in the brain, including serotonin and dopamine. So it helps us to create new neurotransmitters and, um, it also just can really help lower a lot of those symptoms like the cramping and stuff. So, um, again, it's best starting to take at ovulation if you just want to supplement for part of the month. And a lot of the foods that include high amounts of B6 are um, animal foods. Like the highest amount you can get is in chicken and eggs and fish. Um, Also, nutritional yeast is pretty high in B6. And then things like sunflower seeds and walnuts and some 
I have like some, you know, but not as much. Animal foods really do have the highest amount. But therapeutically, if you were wanting to work with PMS symptoms, uh, the therapeutic dose is around 300 to 600 milligrams a day. Um, and so that's a lot more than you would if you were to look at, for example, a, the back of like a B, full spectrum B vitamin, you'd probably only see like 50 to 150 milligrams of B6. So um, supplementing that can also be really helpful. Um, so I want to just say for anyone who's listening and is like, I don't know when I'm ovulating, you know, that of course there, there are so many resources out there to help you track and to know when you're ovulating. But one of the most clear indications is that cervical mucus. I, like I, I always know the day I'm ovulating because I suddenly have that cervical mucus on my toilet paper or in my underwear. And then I'll check my period tracker app, which I also think every woman should have because it's, for me at least, super accurate. And it's always like, yep, that day is the day that I'm ovulating. Yeah, it can be. There's so many ways that you can tell. I mean, the cervical mucus is great. And I really encourage women to get familiar with the way that it shifts throughout the cycle. I think that's another thing that um, as young women, we're not really told about. And I remember being a younger woman and not really knowing if I was healthy or not, like being embarrassed that I had something on my underwear and not knowing what that was. And it wasn't until I got a lot older and was like, oh, wow, that's healthy cervical fluid. Okay. Um, so, you know, that's something too, that's really great to get to know your own body. And you can also do that through taking your basal body temperature. So first thing in the morning, when you wake up before you even get out of bed or go to the bathroom or do anything, you can take your temperature and track that throughout the month. And, um, you know, there's a lot of books and resources that go really in depth into this. But as we approach ovulation, our temperature will actually spike. We'll get a little bit of a spike in our temperature and our temperature will then stay high generally from um, ovulation then towards when our, we have our menses. So it's that's another great way that you can check um, when you're ovulating. And I really recommend the book, Taking Charge of Your Fertility. It's a really, really great resource and it has all sorts of information of, about tracking your cycle and preventing pregnancy or wanting to get pregnant and um, really how to do tracking in a very responsible way so you can actually use it as a form of birth control if you choose. I also wanted to touch on, you mentioned last time we talked, the book um, Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom by Dr. Christian Northrup. And yeah, I just want to like plug that book too, because I was thinking about it and that book has been so, so foundational in my life. I first read it in my early, early twenties, like maybe 20. And it just, it, it literally changed everything, everything for me. I was really reflecting on this after our conversation. Um, I like take it so much for granted how much that book changed my life that I don't think I've ever really talked about it publicly. It's just, I just take it so for granted and, you know, I got it off my shelf again and was looking at it and I was like, yep, yeah, this is just as good as it was back then. And I think that absolutely every woman should have it in her home. Definitely. And I just have to say, don't be intimidated by how big it is. Um, you can just read sections of it. But I definitely my copy is basically falling apart. <laughs> I reference that book all of the time and it has so much crucial information for women to just be empowered and really understand all the processes that are happening in their body and um, how to eat to support our cycle and how to deal with all sorts of different issues that come up um, as women. So I definitely really recommend that book as well. Yeah, it is super thick, but it's a lot of that thickness too is personal stories um, of clients that she's had in her practice. And, you know, I find those like really useful and helpful and yeah, love that book. Um, I wonder what you think about the use of and effects of coffee and chocolate and the menstrual cycle. Well, you know, I think it's, it's kind of dependent person to person on how you tolerate it. One thing that can really 
come up in the cycle for women is basically um, having your breasts feel super sore or having um, cyclical cysts. So basically painful cysts that kind of ebb and flow as your cycle moves through. And so if you are a woman who's dealt with cysts before or you're currently dealing with cysts, there's a compound that's in coffee and chocolate, caffeine basically, um, that's called methylxanthines. And there has been a lot of clinical studies that have showed that that actually has an effect on those cyclical um, cysts and kind of the breast swelling and breast tenderness. So if that's an aspect that you deal with in your cycle, I definitely recommend, you know, taking it out for a couple months and seeing if you notice a difference. I think if you eat a little chocolate every now and again, probably not a big deal, but if you're drinking coffee daily and you're drinking, um, you know, cacao daily, or you're getting a lot of caffeine and a lot of coffee or chocolate, and you are having really painful breasts during your cycle, it's definitely an aspect to look at. Okay, thank you. And you have a really great blog post up on your website about iron and women's health. And how, like, how does iron play into the menstrual cycle? And do you think that most women should be supplementing with it? Um, iron is actually one of the most common nutrient deficiencies in the United States. And um, it's, it's something crazy. Like I think 30 to almost 60% of healthy women are deficient in iron. And so that's a, that's a huge amount. And that can be from a host of different things. But obviously when we menstruate, when we lose blood, we're losing iron. So making sure that we're getting enough iron in our diets is really important. And an aspect of this that needs to be taken into consideration is kind of what type of iron that you're getting. Um, So first of all, iron is really necessary for so much in the body. It's necessary for our growth and development, for our cellular function. It helps us synthesize all of our hormones. And it's really important for oxygenation of the brain and all of our cognitive functions. So it's hugely important in so many processes, way more than just has to do with our um, our cycles. So it's super important that we have enough. And there's two main forms of dietary iron. So there's heme iron and non-heme iron. And so heme iron comes from animal products, so meat and seafood and poultry. And then non-heme iron is plant sources. And so the thing is, we don't convert non-heme iron into the same iron that um, that heme iron is. And so it's really it's really hard for people who don't eat animal products to get enough of the type of iron that they need. And so I definitely recommend if it, if you are a vegetarian or a vegan and you're not eating animal products, that you definitely need to look into supplementing iron. Um, and, you know, it just depends also on, on your cycle. Like if you are someone who has a heavy flow, then you're probably losing a lot more iron than someone who doesn't have a heavy flow and also, you know, after giving birth or um, a miscarriage or even someone who has uterine fibroids, those are ways that we can also lose a lot of iron. So, you know, you might, some of the symptoms of iron deficiency that you might notice are tiredness and lack of energy, uh, poor memory and concentration, just having a hard time remembering stuff. Um, getting sick often or not having a great ability to fight off infection or um, having a hard time controlling your body temperature. So getting really cold all the time. And so those are some of the main symptoms of kind of anemia, iron deficiency. And honestly, I see a lot of women that experience those symptoms. So I do think it's really important. And I do think that we can get it from foods, like I said, 
all of our um, animal products, eggs and meats, all of our organ meats are really high in iron. This is something if you do eat meat, I really recommend getting organ meats into the diet. Like liver is one of the best sources of iron that we can have. And it's such an amazing whole food. Um, and then also a lot of our herbs, a lot of our herbs have a lot of iron. So um, nettles have a lot of iron and yellow dock has iron and all of our um, kind of dark leafy greens have iron. Spirulina is a really great place to get that. Molasses has iron. So, you know, we can get a lot from herbs and foods, but I definitely recommend some sort of focus on making sure that you're getting a lot of iron rich foods around your cycle or doing some sort of supplementation. And um, you, you absorb iron better when you eat it with foods that contain vitamin C. So citrus and strawberries and peppers, tomatoes, stuff like that will help you to absorb your iron better. Thank you. Um, I also want to talk about another book right now. This is one of my very favorite books of all time, which is saying a lot. And it's called Sex, Time, and Power, How Women's Bodies Shaped Human Evolution. The author is Leonard Schlein. S-H-L-A-I-N, and he talks in the beginning quite a bit about iron in like an evolutionary perspective. And I remember one thing he writes about is the six ways that women lose iron. And I don't remember all of them, but there's, of course, menstruation and childbirth and lactation is one too. But he's really making the point that like women lose iron, you know, and men basically have zero pathways for losing iron. So um, it's you know, just kind of built into our anatomy over millions of years of evolution and is something that we need to be really aware of the lack of. Yeah. And another thing that I, I love him, by the way, he's yes. such an amazing author. Yeah. Um, I met him, Anya, right after that book came out, I met him in Sacramento at a book signing and um, he died unexpectedly like a year or two later. Have you read his book? I think it's called The Alphabet and the Goddess. The Alphabet versus the Goddess, yes. Versus the Goddess. Yeah, that book really opened my eyes to a lot when I was younger. He's yeah. a pretty amazing author. He was a genius. It's so sad that he that he passed. Yeah. Um, the one other thing that I wanted to say about iron supplementation is that um, – a lot of things can interfere with the our, the way we absorb iron in the body. So um, calcium, tannins in foods, oxalates, like all sorts of stuff. So it's really best to supplement if not taken with food. So if you are going to take an iron supplement, you want to take it like first thing in the morning before you eat your food. So you're make sure that as much as you um, as much iron as you actually need and. I, my supplementation, I make an iron syrup and that's kind of the way that I get a lot of my iron and it's just full of a bunch of different herbs and berries and has vitamin C and has uh, spirulina and molasses and is just like a really mineral rich iron syrup. And so that is a really nice way if you make medicines or if you have access to, um, you know, purchase herbal medicine. If you aren't really into supplementation, making an iron syrup or taking an iron syrup can be a really great way to get a lot of that iron into, and they're delicious. Oh, wow. Yeah. I remember looking at that product on your website recently and being like, this looks amazing. Um, so anyone who entered or will enter our giveaway, that would be something if you win that you could get from Anya's shop. Definitely. Uh, yeah. Um, so, okay. I mean, you're just you're, you're so, you're so amazing. It's amazing the way your mind works and this business that you've built and this consulting practice. And, um, you're just like a really impressive person. <laughs> and, but you, you have this history of, of drug abuse. And I would love to hear, I just, I love hearing people's like personal stories of growth and transformation and change, especially when it comes to addictive behaviors, because so many people don't get out of that. Um, so would you mind sharing, you know, what, what that looked like for you and how you changed? 
Yeah, well, you know, sometimes when I think back about it, it's kind of a trip because it really, at this point, feels like such a different life. Like it doesn't even feel like my life sometimes. But I think for me, I grew up, um, my mother was an alcoholic. So for the majority of my childhood and into my early teenage years, um, my mom had a pretty severe drinking problem. And so that was just really challenging being, you know, a young person and in my early teens dealing with that and kind of the ramifications of having that in my family. It really started splitting my family and, you know, I really wanted to fix everything and and just make everything okay at that point. And, And I sort of reached a point where I couldn't really handle it anymore. It just was way too intense. And I'm also a pretty sensitive person and pretty empathic. And um, just seeing my family kind of being split apart by this was really, really hard. So I actually moved out on my own when I was 15. And I was working two jobs and in high school and kind of doing that. And I think that, you know, I wasn't drinking a lot at that point, because I was kind of jaded around that. But I I just kind of turned to drugs and alcohol as a way to cope with and deal with the depression that I had and just the sadness that I was experiencing from kind of watching my mom um, spiral out and just the area that I grew up in that I had access to any sort of drugs that I wanted to get my hands on and just kind of ended up in a in a bad crew of people and and it just really spiraled out of control and um probably from the time I was like 16 until maybe like I was 21 or 22 I had a a pretty serious issue with um alcohol and with drugs and kind of just you know, I was still working and had a home and I wasn't on the street or anything, but I was definitely abusing alcohol and drugs on a daily basis and just getting myself into really bad situations. And, and it just really wasn't, um, it wasn't shifting. I didn't really have any desire. I didn't know really who I was or what I wanted to be. I was just constantly in a state of being numb to the world. And I think I was just so afraid to actually face how I felt. And so it was a lot easier for me to continue to numb everything out. And um, actually, the thing that really pulled me out of it, interestingly enough, was um, my mom passing away. Um, So she passed away when I was 23. And she died from liver cirrhosis. So basically, the drinking totally destroyed her liver. And at that point, I just had sort of a huge awakening and kind of epiphany on how precious life is and how short life is. And we didn't know that my mom had cirrhosis. She was not telling us. Obviously, the doctors had probably told her. And we knew that obviously she'd been drinking for a long time and she wasn't in very good health. But it it kind of happened out of the blue and I was living in Oregon and my mom was in Washington and I got a phone call at four in the morning saying that I needed to fly home and I might not get to say goodbye to my mom. And by the time I got up there, she was, you know, not conscious again. And I never really got to talk with her before she passed, but that whole experience, um, kind of looking back on it and reflecting in a lot of ways was such a huge initiation in my life. And it really, it got me, I quit my job. I, um, I moved down to Southern Oregon. I started farming and I enrolled in herb school and I just kind of had to get out of being in the service industry and working in restaurants and being around alcohol all the time and just the friend group that I had been surrounding myself with all of it kind of, I just had to like do something else. And I really, as 
sad as that whole situation was and how as challenging as it really was now i'm i'm so grateful for that and as much as i really wish that my mom was still with me i also really feel like i have her to thank for me being on this path because i think that i would have spent a lot more time in that space and continuing to just kind of not go anywhere and and just kind of you know drink and my my time away and that was just such a huge wake up call and it was really the catalyst that shifted so much in my life so at at this point when i look back at that i really am thankful that that happened and you know i've always been a plant person and i do feel like the plants would have called me in in a different way in a different time had that not happened but i think just the drastic nature of how my life shifted so completely after she passed away um was was pretty profound mm, wow yeah as a as a child of an alcoholic father i um understand a lot of what you were saying and uh i'm so sorry that you went through that it, it seems like such a really hard time too, like in adolescence to really be reckoning with a parent's addiction. Um, yeah, I was, I was 12 when my mom first told me that my dad was an alcoholic, but I had no idea because he was just kind of a quiet, uh, inwardly drawn person. And it wasn't until like my college years that I started having really big feelings around it. And like, why are you doing this? And why aren't we enough? Did you feel like that? Like, why, why is that more important than your family? Yeah. And, you know, it was just such, um, just such a heartbreaking situation really because my dad stuck around for a long time. My parents didn't divorce until I was almost 19. So my dad really stuck through for a good decade, um, and really, you know, tried to help and she was in and out of rehab. And, you know, I come from a family that I had, we had privilege, like she had the ability to go, to inpatient rehab centers and all of, you know, she had so many opportunities and so many people that loved her and gave her so many chances. And she was really, really just, my dad was her whole world. And as much as that was the case, she couldn't stop drinking. And so once they finally um, divorced, it was just, she, as much as I feel like her liver actually gave out. I really feel like she died from a broken heart. She was so just totally devastated after her and my dad split. And, you know, I, I always would try and talk to her and, and be like, well, you have, you know, me and Hunter, who's my younger brother. And, you know, you have, you have family and this could be a chance to start over. And yeah, just, we weren't enough. Her children wasn't enough to to fight to try and live. And that was a really, really hard thing to deal with at that point in my life. And she didn't pass for like another four or five years. So I think those times were like particularly really challenging and dark for me, just having that feeling of like, this is my mother and like, I am her child and we are not enough of a reason for her to care about her life. Mm -hmm. So it's really hard hard thing at that age to comprehend what that uh, yeah is. but knowing more now and just being older and having experienced life I mean you there's so many nutrient deficiencies you're basically incredibly malnourished when you're an alcoholic mm -hmm. and in that case you're not creating any sort of you know um neurotransmitters or thing, you know, she was dealing with severe depression as well and malnutrition. And, you know, there's a lot of things that make it really challenging for a person in that particular space to be able to recover. And that's something that uh, I find really ironic and odd about just kind of detox programs or inpatient programs, because they're still feeding people like crap. Mm. They're feeding them totally non-nutritious food and they're not talking about um nutrition and really like if you want someone that's in an addiction to come out of that you really really need to make sure that they have the building blocks like the foundational materials 
to have a healthy brain chemistry. And it's just something that's not really talked about in the realm of addiction that much. Oh, that is such a good point. I think all the time too with my dad, who amazingly is still living. I I cannot believe this man is still alive. Um, 68, 30 plus years into this addiction. He's been hospitalized four times in the last four years, has, you know, severe withdrawals when he tries to quit, has seizures, has fallen, there's blood all over his room. It's crazy. Um, but I think about like that he's so addicted to sugar too. It's like a sugar addiction as well. My gosh. Yeah. (laughs) It's a massive sugar addiction. So there's a lot of dysregulation of blood sugar and yeah. Insulin intolerance and just or whatever that, that phrase is. Yeah. It's, and that's so bad for you on its own. You know, we know like what, uh, type two diabetes does to people and it's basically you're in like a constant pre-diabetic condition. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and that's something, it's just so interesting to me as I, you know, have delved more into my path of health and also just really understanding brain chemistry and and just the deeper kind of ways that the body works. I'm still so blown away that we don't have more resources out there or there's not more education around um, around getting people's nutrient levels up before before you start them th- going through a withdrawal. Mm. There's actually, you know, a few, I've had some friends that have struggled with addiction and I found a couple rehab centers in the country, only a couple after hours and hours and hours of research that you go in and you, they initially like take a blood panel and look at all your nutrient levels and give you vitamin injections for a week before they start you on your like withdrawal process so you can actually handle your body can handle going through the withdrawal and then you can start to be you know rebuilding um the brain chemistry to actually have the energy and the capacity to start to deal with the addiction wow yeah that seems so basic right and and no wonder you know addiction is so hard to overcome when when you don't have the correct nutrients to rebuild and there, you know, unfortunately, with a lot of addiction, there's a lot of lack of access. You know, that's a huge, not always, you know, there's definitely people that have access that are addicted. But I mean, there's also a lot of people that don't. And so, you know, the foods or the nutrients or the things that they have access to are not going to support them in their process towards not being addicted. So it's it's just the whole thing is, is really hard. But I definitely feel you and and resonate with everything you were saying about your dad. And that was very similar to, to my experience with my mom, just constantly in and out of the hospital and broken bones and DUIs and, you know, just on and on and on. Um, and you know, it's, it's a really hard, it's a hard thing for people to live with and to be a family member of someone who is an addict. But I also think that, Um, you know, I kind of think about it as like sort of the archetype of Chiron looking at the wounded healer and, and really thinking about how our trials and tribulations and our stories and our experiences really shape us to be the people that we are. And I think as, you know, for both of us as women who work with plant medicine and work with healing, um, and in different like physical and energetic capacities, having gone through these experiences makes you so much more understanding and empathetic to a lot of things that people are experiencing in their life. And at least for myself, I feel like I'm able to meet people where they're at or kind of, you know, I've walked in the dark side a lot. So I have a lot more understanding and patience and empathy with that with clients than maybe I would if I had not been through so many of those experiences myself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Oh, it's making me sad to think about right now. It's just, you know, it's um, how deeply an addiction changes a person. It especially when you're super far into it and 
maybe especially with alcohol, I'm not sure, but alcohol is just so insidious, you know, and oh man, I just think about my dad's just a completely different person than he used to be. He was so fun and um, kind and compassionate and moral and considerate. And he really raised us to be that way too and um, empathetic. And now he's just, He's none of those things, you know, even like when he's in the hospital, especially when he's going through withdrawals, he's a freaking asshole to all the nurses. <laughs> my sister and I were like, oh my God, dad, you can't treat people like, like what you specifically raised us not to treat people like that. And who even are you? And his capacity for empathy is just completely not present anymore. He's not a parent in any way anymore, even though he's still there and he can talk to us and be like, how, how are the kids and have some memories of things. It's just, it's like you replaced one person with another person. Yeah, I definitely experienced that. I mean, I think at a certain point, your brain just gets pickled. Yeah. <laughs> like, especially with alcohol, particularly it's, I mean, it really does shift so much brain chemistry that, yeah, it's, they're not the same person. And and that's really hard to, you know, it's, it's not only even when someone's living like your dad, you're still like grieving the loss of a parent, even though they're still physically here, which is a strange, um, yeah, strange place to be in. Yeah. Today, today is the three year anniversary of the day I found out that my mom died. So yesterday was the three year anniversary of her car accident. And my sister and I always talk about how we lost both of our parents, you know, and, and one really crazy thing too, is that the night she died, my dad went into the hospital and they'd been divorced for a decade or maybe more at that point. But, um, so we were, you just woke up and we're both like, what, what, <laughs> what M mom's dead and, and dad's in the hospital. And so, you know, it was even weeks before we could tell him, that she died and he's just always been like, Oh, so sad about your mom, you know, but no real presence or empathy with it. And yeah, we just feel like, Oh, we're like, we're orphans. He's still alive, but he's, he's not. Yeah. Ugh, that's so tragic losing your mom in an accident like that. So suddenly, and I, I just don't think that dealing with death is ever really easy, but I definitely, you know, even though my mom wasn't, um, in the best of health because she was drinking a lot. I definitely, you know, just it's so shocking to get a phone call and to have um, to have someone just basically be gone is is such a it's such a trip for the mind to wrap itself around a concept like that. Yeah, yeah, it is. I, my my um my mom's husband left me a voicemail the night before telling me what happened. And I remember getting it that morning and calling him back and being like, so what, <laughs> what happened? You know? And he told me about the accident. I said, and she's dead, uh, you know, just like what? It, yeah. And yeah, I, <laughs> it's, I haven't really talked about it much on the podcast, which is interesting. It came up in my conversation with Daniel four about ancestral healing, but and I did so many posts and talked so much about it um, when it first happened, but I don't know, it's just, it's hard. It's weird. It's like the, the more time goes on, the harder of a time I have, even trying to put words into what a huge experience it is to lose someone you love so much so suddenly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I still struggle to find words to talk about it and I'm coming up on nine, it'll be nine years this year and it's just kind of you know, I don't, I don't know that you ever, um, get over it. You know, I think yeah. that, and I think that you get more familiar with the feeling of having that, but I really, um, I think it was in one of your early podcasts when you had the guests on that were talking about the kind of the green burial and the dying out loud and mm -hmm. the whole, um, I really, the man on there said something like, I never plan on like not grieving for the loss of my wife. Yeah. And I, that just struck such a deep chord for me because in our culture, you know, where it's just kind of like, okay, grieve and move on. And, 
And I think it's important to realize that it's possible to grieve in a good and healthy way and to that we're never going to just get over it. That's not really the way that it works. Uh, yeah, of course. It, it's so crazy that we do take that for granted in this culture that you get over it and you move through it. And um, yeah, that was episode five with Richard and Carrie Loversey. If anyone wants to go back and hear it, Um, Carrie died six days after we recorded that interview and the one year anniversary of her death was just last week. Um, And it's just a really beautiful look at death and facing mortality and grieving and loving someone. And it's just a beautiful interview and right here too, I would like to talk about another book, which is It's Okay That You're Not Okay by Megan Devine um, mm-hmm. and her website, Refuge in Grief. She is by far the most um, emotionally intelligent and competent person in the grief space out there. She lost her fiance. Uh, he drowned in front of her. I think it's been 10 years now. I think it was 2008. And she had already been a therapist at that point. And you know, she writes about how She's like, I would like to apologize to all of my pre-2008 clients who were grieving, who I tried to help because I did not understand. And I thought that you would get over it at some point. And I thought our goal was to get you beyond grief. And now I know that you never get beyond grief. It's just a matter of being companioned while you're in it. So anyone who especially is going through a sudden or traumatic loss, um, Megan Devine and refugeingrief.com is such an amazing resource. Um, so thanks, Anya, for sharing and letting me share myself and, you know, PMSing and going through this anniversary. So it's been a really heavy couple days. And um, I know we touch on some similar things when we talk today. Yeah, it seems like we have definitely some some similar things in our path, although kind of different but um it is it is nice to talk about it and I think sometimes um even just with my whole story and my past of a kind of addiction and and what that was like in my life sometimes you know I kind of forget that part or it's it's not something that I bring up often because you know unless it's it's really relevant but I've really come a long a long way from there but I think for me kind of reflecting on what I was going to say today and just kind of thinking about um, what that's meant to me in my life. I I think the main thing that I really feel is like it's never too late to do something else with your life. Mm -hmm. Every day you have the chance to make better choices and different decisions and be a better version of yourself and and, you know, it's such a, a trip now looking at what I'm doing in my life and how easy it would have been for me to continue on the path of drug addiction. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the people that I knew during that part in my life are either passed away at this point or are in jail or are still addicted to drugs. Um, and, you know, just really looking at that and being like, wow, I'm so glad that I got out, you know, that I that I knew that I had a bigger purpose and that I had more to live for than that. And, and just believing that we can really make huge shifts in our life when, when we're really determined and when we believe in ourselves. I think that's kind of the, the main thing that I wanted to impart on that story. Yeah, totally. One thing I, I think about and have said before is like, you know, a year from now is coming no matter what you do between now and a year from now. 10 years from now is going to be here if you're lucky and you live that long. So you have this choice and what you fill that time with and where it ends you up in those 10 years. And I remember saying that to my dad regarding his alcoholism a few years ago. And he was like, you know, when did you get so much smarter than me? (laughs) I was like, yeah, but if you would just listen and, you know, maybe, maybe you could retain your own wisdom, inner wisdom that's been so, you know, this has been taken from him. Um, and you know, yeah, having an alcoholic father too made me really aware of not becoming addicted myself. Like I even start to get weirded out when I notice that I'm addicted to coffee. I'm like, Oh, I'm in an addictive phase with coffee. I don't like this. I just never want a substance to be ruling my life more than like my own, my own self, my own consciousness my own like true soul being in charge 
Definitely. Yeah. I mean, it, it's a great motivation not to do that when you have to live kind of in the aftermath of, of what that of what addiction can be in your life. And another thing that I am grateful for is just, you know, plant medicine and, and natural healing. And for my own body, just, you know, knowing how much I've been able to heal myself and how much damage I probably did over like a 10 year period of, of not taking care of myself. And I definitely had some like severe health, um, issues after that. And I've been able to really turn that around and, um, really, you know, take care of myself in a way that I've come back from all of the kind of damage that I did. So I think that's another important thing to realize too, that our bodies are so resilient. And as long as we're providing them with good nutrients and herbs and rest, and we're really giving it kind of what it needs, that it has such a capacity to rebuild and restore and um, kind of repair the damages done. So I like to remind people of that too. You know, our bodies are just so miraculous. Yeah, absolutely. That vital life force is stronger than any of this, any of this stuff. Um, so I was also curious, something that you mentioned is this great, great or great grandmother of yours. Um, mm. Will you tell us about her and what, what you learned about her life? Yeah. Um, so it's interesting because I really just found this out. I want to say like two years ago, but I've, I've been into, you know, the occult and, um, I've been into astrology and tarot since I was fairly young, like 15 or 16. I really started diving into reading tarot and, and studying astrology and have always kind of just been fascinated with that realm. And, um, I, I actually got a phone call from one of my uncles, my mom's youngest brother, a, a few years back. And, you know, he was like, I have I have something that I need to tell you. And I feel like you're the only person that's going to understand. And I really I just need someone to talk to about this. And I had no idea what he was going to say. And and he was like, I've been reading Tarot since I was 15. And I really think I want to tell the family about it. But I'm afraid that of how they're going to react or how they're going to kind of judge me. And my uncle just, I had no idea. He did not strike me as someone who kind of was interested in that, or I'd never talked to him about that at all. And I was just excited, of course. And we talked about it. And, and then he sort of made some sort of offhand comment of, uh, about um, my great grandmother. So my mom's mom's mother, um, that she was sort of the town, like mystic and healer. So they lived um, in a small town in Germany in Heidelberg. And she used to do tarot readings and do kind of different um, work like that. And she would lock all of the kids out of the house and was making money for the family by by being a mystic, basically. And I just absolutely freaked out when I <laughs> heard that and I was like why has nobody ever told me this I'm over here being the black sheep of the family and <laughs> all of this stuff and I think in that moment I just had such a deep sense of belonging and a really deep sense of um, just realizing that you know some of the things that we inherit are so much deeper and kind of yeah just this feeling of just so much gratitude that I learned that about my family. And of course, during that time, um, you know, it was Germany during the end of World War II. And that sort of thing was definitely frowned upon. So I think nobody in my family really talked about it because it was embarrassing. And it was, you know, just hush hush. And no one, no one talked about it. And so it's been interesting to kind of talk with my grandma a little bit more and, and hear more about that part of my life. But it definitely kind of confirmed a lot of suspicions that I had that somewhere in my family there was there was more going on, that there was some witches in there somewhere. And I actually also found out after that that my grandmother was actually born in the Black Forest. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, it's 
I've been really inspired um, in the last few years to really look at a lot of my family history and really inspired by you and Mila and just our different conversations and and wanting to know more about where my family's from and um, and asking questions. And I realized I just really had never asked very many questions. And now that, you know, I'm curious and starting to ask questions to different people in my family, I've learned so much that I, I kind of thought was not there because no one ever talked about anything. Um, and I, I'm just finding the more that I ask, the more that I'm finding out, which feels really precious because, you know, those, those people won't always be there and those stories will kind of die with them. So mm-hmm. it's just really important to, um, to ask. Yep. Yep. That's just step one, you know, is asking all the elders who are still living for, um, practical info, like names and dates and places, but also for the stories. Cause once they're gone, those stories are gone. Um, and that's really profound too, that it's your pure matrilineal line that this woman comes from. I mean, that's such a strong, unbroken line of women, you know? Um, and that I just think there's something really potent about the pure mother line. And it's interesting too, that your mom was a product of that. And I wonder, like, do you, was your mom a sensitive person? You know, do you think there was any sort of you know, echoes of her grandmother in her? Oh my gosh. I think, I mean, 100%, my mom was such a huge empath and such a sensitive person. And she was also like a triple Pisces. Um, And I mean, I, I really think that the world was just too much for her. And I think also, um, things like being a highly sensitive person or being an empath, those, um, you know, those are kind of more coming to light now in our current day and age, but I don't know that there was always like a language for that or an understanding for that. Um, and, and I don't think people always had the resources or the understanding of how to cope with the world when you are such a sensitive person. And unfortunately I feel like my mom found that coping through, um, through kind of numbing out, but there's a lot, there's a lot of interesting stories in my family and, um, both my, my brother and I have, um, like dreams about things before they happen. My brother and I are are super connected as well. And, um, actually have had the same due date five years apart. (laughs) And, um, my mom's water never broke with either of us. Mm-hmm. So we were both born in the coal, which is oh, pretty weird. Yeah. Lots, um, lots of heavy symbolism and beliefs around what that means, you know, really special people. Yeah. And it's just interesting because I feel like my mom had a lot of that and I see a lot of that in my brother. He's very, um, has a lot of kind of psychic sort of tendencies and and also I see a lot of the overwhelm that that causes him in his life like not really fully knowing how to like handle it or deal with it and I think that that is um, a big conversation for people that are really sensitive or do have kind of these these different skills and um, kind of sensory gating channels that are open in different ways it can be really tough to exist in this world that tells you that like this box is what normal is. And when you don't fit inside of that, like, where do you really fit? Yeah. Yeah. It's really similar in my family and my dad is so empathic and so sensitive and um, all the Hills, you know, the, his line, the men, especially are all the same way, or maybe I just knew the men. I didn't really know any women in his side very well, but um, and then my sister and I are both the same way, and my sister especially. And yeah, she's just like straight up psychic. You know, she's so gifted, but she's so overwhelmed by the world. And it's really been a a more difficult path for her dealing with with those sensory gating channels. Which let's talk about another book now. Um, if you want to learn more about those, <laughs> Stephen Herod Buner's um, what is plant intelligence in the imaginal realm really, really takes a deep dive into sensory gating channels. Yeah, I, I absolutely, I mean, Steven Buner is one of my all time, uh, just, you know, 
idols and I love everything that he's written and his teachings have really, really influenced so much of my life, but I can't recommend that book enough. It's so amazing. And just really understanding, you know, the mechanisms in the brain of how we're perceiving information and how that can affect us. It is just, I feel like everyone should read that book. (laughs) Yeah. And actually now that I'm saying this, I remember that we talked about that on when he was on this podcast in episode eight as well. Um, Wow. Yeah. Thank you, Anya. So in closing, let's circle back around to herbalism and to nutrition. And I'd like to ask you like how you're shifting what you're eating or what you're doing in your life now that um, winter has descended. Yeah, well, um, so, you know, in Ayurveda, we're really looking at the kind of the elements that are present in every season. And the fall time um, tends to be really cold and and dry. And then in the winter, depending on where you are, um, but generally it's the qualities of winter are um, like cold and damp. And so I really, um, I eat a lot of warming foods. I eat a lot of soups and stews and um, cooked vegetables and a lot of warming spices like ginger and cinnamon and cardamom and, um, you know, like peppers and all sorts of things that will increase blood circulation and kind of warm up the agni or the digestive fire so we can kind of heat ourselves from the inside out. And also because a lot of people tend to get really dry in the winter, um, you know, broths and soups and really um, liquidy foods are, are super, super nourishing. And um, and also just, gra- you know, I do a lot of grounding foods. I eat a lot of um, kind of meat and stuff in the winter to really sustain me. And I can eat smaller portions and feel feel really energized but I I mostly just kind of try and shift also just what's available seasonally where you're at like you know there's so many squash and all of the root vegetables and all of the things that kind of grow in the ground and are really nutrient dense those are the foods that are typically depending on what bio region you're in but those are the foods that are in season during the winter and so those are the foods that I really like to to focus on. Um, and it is a time that's okay to eat a little heavier and denser and and because we need that extra energy and we're kind of storing o- up over the winter. And then in the spring, we're able to kind of start to cleanse some of that and eat some of the spring foods that help us to kind of move some of that heaviness that we've accrued during the winter. But in Ayurveda, just the the broths and the soups and the spices and, you know, warming beverages like golden milk and chai and all sorts of stuff like that are really great additions to your winter regimen. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited about chai and making bone broth and doing a lot of root vegetable roasts and um, really focusing on carminatives. So you write about carminatives on your blog, and I just think this is such a simple category of herbs and something everyone already has in their kitchen and can help with issues that everyone has. Can you just give us a little rundown about carminatives? Yeah, so carminatives are a group of herbs that are just really helpful for digestion. So they can help stimulate um, bile secretion. They can help with gas and bloating or um, any sort of digestive upset. And they also just help to get our kind of gastric juices flowing. And so they're really simple herbs, things like ginger and cinnamon, fennel, um, all, you know, all of those kind of warming spices, like a lot of the spices that are in a curry powder. Yeah. Cumin, cardamom, black pepper. Um, exactly. So all of those things kind of help to, to stimulate our digestive system. So not only are they warming and nourishing and helping to warm us up, but they're also really helping our digestion. So when we do eat these heavier foods and soups and stews and things like that, that we're also getting these herbs that help to kind of upregulate our digestive system and help make sure that we're really breaking everything down, um, 
well. And a lot of these herbs are also really supportive to our liver as well. So it's kind of, we're getting the the liver support and the, the digestive support. And, you know, they are such a simple class of herbs that you don't have to take a tincture or bitters or anything like that. And you can just add them, you know, sprinkle them onto your food and really feel the effects of like, oh, wow, my stomach was really upset. I'm going to have some, you know, ginger cardamom tea or, you know, just adding those those herbs to your chai. You know, that not only is that a delicious drink, but it's also a really medicinal beverage that's doing a lot of stuff to help support your digestive system. So carminatives are definitely just really great in the in the winter. And I actually, I wrote a blog post a couple, a month or so back on, it's kind of speaking a little bit more to like autumn, but the autumn to winter transition and some sort of Ayurvedic um, tips and ideas around how to eat seasonally. And there's some good recipes in there. So you can check that out on the blog if you're interested in that. All right. Awesome, Anya. Thank you. And um, why don't you again, for anyone who didn't listen to the last interview, tell people where they can find you? Yeah, well, you can find me on my website. It's manamedicinals.net. And I have all sorts of information on there for my private practice, um, for doula services. And also I do a lot of blog posts and writing and kind of information on where you'll find me teaching. So you can find everything there. And also there's a link to my apothecary there as well. Mm, You know, that just reminded me, and I just feel like I want to share this with you, that um, the first time I ever heard about home birth was in Women's Bodies, Women's Wisdom. And I remember it just made me sob. I was so touched by it. And I was like, I have to do this someday. I have to have my babies at home. And then I did. And at that time, too, I thought I would be a midwife. Like I went to a Midwifery Today conference in Eugene, Oregon um, in the early 2000s and really looked into into being a birth worker. And it was because of that book. Yeah, it's so good. I hope everyone who's listening to this, this ends up getting themselves a copy. Yeah. Thank you for all the work you do, including your birth work. And thank you so much for talking to me today. Yeah, thanks so much, Amber. This has been great, and I really appreciate you having me back on here. Anytime. All right. Talk to you soon. Thank you for taking these medicine stories in. I hope they inspire you to keep walking the mythic path of your own unfolding self. I love sharing information and will always put any relevant links in the show notes. You can find my blog, Handmade Herbal Medicines, past podcast episodes, and a lot more at mythicmedicine.love. While you're there, I invite you to click the purple banner across the top of the page to take my quiz, Which Healing Herb Is Your Plant Familiar? It's a fun and lighthearted quiz, but the results are really in-depth and designed to bring you into closer alignment with the medicine that you're in need of. If you love the show, please consider supporting my work at patreon.com slash medicine stories. There's some killer rewards there, um, exclusive content, access to online courses, free, beautiful, downloadable eBooks, coupon codes, giveaways, and just amazing gifts provided by past guests of the podcast. All of that stuff is at the $2 a month level. Um, for a little more, you can access my herbal ebook or my small online course. And that's all there as a thank you, a huge thank you from me and from my guests for listening, for supporting this work. I love figuring out what I can give to people on Patreon. It's so fun. And I love that Patreon makes it that you can um, contribute for such a small amount a month. I'm a crazy busy and overwhelmed mom and adding this project into my life has been a questionable move for sure, but I love doing it and I love the feedback that I get from you all and I just pray that the Patreon continues to allow me the financial wiggle room to keep on doing it while giving back to everyone who's listening Um, If you're unable to do that, or if you'd like to support further, I would love it if you would subscribe 
on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And if you would review the podcast on iTunes too, really helps get it into other ears. And it means so much to me when I read those reviews. It's um, like the highlight of my week when I check them and see new ones. And people are amazing. You guys are wonderful. Thank you so much. The music that opens and closes the show is by Marie Sue, M-A-R-I-E-E. S-I-O-U-X. It's from her song Wild Eyes, which is one of my favorite songs of all time. Thank you so much, and I look forward to next time.